Most of what we believe about the best ways to study are absolutely false. Whatever you believe about how best to learn is probably incorrect. The best learning practices are not intuitive. Fortunately, today you will learn the best ways to study. Now, there are other components to learning in neuroplasticity that are just too interesting not to mention, but I'm just going to mention them in brief. Things like gap effects. Gap effects are oh so cool, and they've been demonstrated for lots of different forms of learning. Gap effects are what I just did, which is to take periodic pauses in the learning of material as short as five to 10 seconds, but even as long as 30 seconds, during which your hippocampus, the neurons in your hippocampus, repeat information that you've been exposed to for the first time at a rate 20 to 30 times faster than typical, just as it does during rapid eye movement sleep. So if you are a teacher and or if you are a learner, periodically throughout an episode, a class or whatever of trying to learn new motor skills or music skills or whatever kind of learning, pause, and let your hippocampus generate more repetitions of that material than it would otherwise if you just tried to barrel through. So I realize that words like test and quiz, evaluation, offsetting forgetting, all of that stuff can you know spike people's cortisol. It can uh, give us flashbacks to uncomfortable classroom experiences related to being called on, cold called for the answer. Keep in mind that testing as a form of studying, whether or not self-directed or given to you by a teacher, is not for sake of evaluation at the level of, okay, you know, you get an exam at the end of a lecture and then you do your best to answer those questions and then you turn it in and it impacts your grade. No, this is about being told or revealing to yourself how much you know and don't know. And then of course being told the correct answers so that you can compare your answers to the correct answers and doing this frequently and ideally very soon after being exposed to the material. That's one of the key things that I keep coming back to again and again here. People hear the word testing, they think of evaluation and that regardless of whether or not you're learning just from YouTube or you're learning from podcasts or you're learning from books or you're learning from the school of life as it were, testing as a form of studying is absolutely key. Now, in terms of emotion, I think we all inherently understand that more emotionally laden experiences are remembered more durably. We tend not to forget them. In fact, this is the basis of things like PTSD, post-traumatic stress disorder. It is the reality that one trial learning, that is exposure to something and never forgetting it, occurs very readily when the thing that we're exposed to is negative or has a very heavy negative emotional salience. So it could be something we read or something we see. Sometimes it's something that happens to us. You know, I, I don't like the idea of that, but this is true. Your nervous system is wired such, neuroplasticity is such that stressful experiences, because they deploy such massive amounts of adrenaline, epinephrine, as well as other neuromodulators, allow very quickly for the milieu, the environment of the neural circuits that led up to that experience to strengthen their connections with one trial, so-called one trial learning. This is why, sadly, although at the same time from an adaptive perspective, we say fortunately, if you were to step outside today and God forbid see somebody get hit by a car, you would remember that. Chances are you would remember that forever. Now, that does not mean that the emotional components of that memory are necessarily going to stay within you. We know that it is the same neuromodulators, mainly epinephrine and norepinephrine, deployed at massive amounts in those moments where something very stressful happens that allows the neural circuits that led up to the circumstance, as well as the neural circuits that encode that visual scene and scenes like it or sounds like it to be locked in and linked to the stress response. Now, what this is really all saying is that negative stuff is remembered typically the first time and every time and very durably as compared to positive experiences, which as far as peak experiences go, right? Birth of your first child, a, a wedding, a wonderful um, professional or personal experience, those too can be one trial learning and memory. But most things that we are exposed to are not at those extremes, either negative or positive. Point here is that if you're a teacher and or if you are a learner, paying attention to your internal state as you're trying to learn is very key, okay? So emotion matters. 
So much so that in a beautiful review about learning and memory from the great James McGaugh, one of the luminaries in modern neuroscience and psychology of memory, he talked about a medieval practice, this is pretty wild, whereby adults and kids were taught information and then thrown, literally thrown into cold water. Why? To deploy adrenaline and consolidate memory of the material they were exposed to. Now, no, I'm not saying you need to do a cold plunge after being exposed to new material, but guess what? Drinking caffeine will increase your levels of epinephrine. Not strikingly so, but enough that it probably helps you learn things a little bit better. The most important components to learning are that you be alert so that you can attend, so you can pay attention to the material you're trying to learn and then testing yourself later. And of course, the other component, which is getting sufficient amounts of great sleep each night. And I highly recommend doing NSDR. I mentioned gap effects before. Those are very, very cool. And the final tool for studying that I believe is not discussed enough and is a bit counterintuitive, so it's a fun one to just mention and that perhaps you can explore in your own studying and learning adventures is interleaving of information. This one's kind of wild, actually. Turns out that if your instructor or you takes information about something that they're trying to teach you or you're trying to learn, Maybe it's piano, maybe it's neuroscience, maybe it's how to learn better. And every once in a while throws in a little anecdote about something, let's just say, or mention something about the Olympics or incorporate something that seems pseudo random because it's not actually related to the material you're trying to learn. Turns out that that acts not as a gap in the same sense that gap effects, which are times in which you do nothing in order to get more repetitions of the material that you just heard in your hippocampus, but rather those breaks of interleaving information, not just getting a steady barrage, like drinking from a fire hose of new information from start to finish, turn out to enhance overall learning ability. Probably, we think, at a mechanistic level, because the neural circuits are able to generate more repetition similar to gap effects, by injecting other information that seems totally unrelated, random or pseudo-random, it allows the brain areas that are responsible for encoding information to take whatever new information you're learning and to incorporate it with existing knowledge or even distantly related knowledge. So does this mean that you should learn math and history in the same lecture? Well, I think that might be a bit overwhelming, kind of like drinking from two fire hoses. Here we're talking about interleaving challenging information that's new to you with little anecdotes, little bits of information that perhaps are new to you, but don't require a lot of challenge, which is of course why every once in a while I throw in a little anecdote about my bulldog or learning neuroanatomy or something of that sort. It's not just to provide a break, it's to provide examples that are related, but not central to the material that we've been talking about today, which is all about how to study and learn optimally. Mm -hmm.